Good afternoon. It's September 11th, 1998. We're here at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Massachusetts. We're interviewing viewing Mr. Arnold Yelsey. Good afternoon, Mr. Yelsey. Good afternoon. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Currently, you are living in Natick? That is correct. And it's my understanding that you are married. That is correct. Tell me a little bit about that. Your wife's name? My wife's name is Frida. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were married in 1950. And uh, you have uh, children? We have uh, three sons. Uh, their names are Alan, Lawrence, and Kenneth. And I understand you have some grandchildren. Yes, we do. We have four grandchildren. We have Ross, who is 17, going on 18. We have Leah, who is uh, around 13. We have Brittany, about 11. And Gregory, who's around 9. And how old are you, Mr. Yelsey? I'm 74. 74 years old. And what community did you grow up in? I grew up in uh, Brooklyn, New, New York. New York. And did you have brothers and sisters? Yes, I had a brother and two sisters. My brother, Benjamin, and my sisters, Helen and Beatrice. And your parents were with you when you grew up in New York? That is correct. And what did they do? My mother was a homemaker. My father was a cantor at a synagogue in uh, Brooklyn. Did he have another job besides that, or was that his full-time job? Uh, he did uh, other things. He lost his voice, unfortunately, and so he did some photography uh, later on, and he taught singing. And what brought you to Natick? Uh, I accepted a position with the Raytheon Company in about 1959, I think. And you bought a home in Natick at that time? That is correct, yes. Is that your current home on Elwyn Road? No, we, uh, we lived in Westfield for a time, and uh, now we live in Elwyn Road, another Campanelli-made home. What do you find that's uh, different from the Natick of today, 1998, versus the Natick of 1959? A uh, great deal of difference, especially Route 9. When we moved here, there was very little industry or businesses on Route 9. I remember Sears being on the corner, and I think Shoppers World was on that side. And uh, I know there was a, uh, uh, some other stores, but not very many, very few. And you l worked in Raytheon f until retirement? No, I worked in Raytheon until 1963, uh, mm -hmm. when I joined the uh, MIT Instrumentation Lab. And, and we can get into that a little later in the interview. In the meantime, um, how old were you when you entered the military? I was 18. 18 years old. And what branch of the military were you en enrolled in? Uh, I, <laughs> I requested that I uh, be in the Signal Corps uh, because my uh, brother-in-law was an engineer at Fort Monmouth, which was the Signal Corps base. And my brother was an electrical engineer, and I thought that would be natural for me. And when I told this to the interviewer, he said, that's interesting. You're in the Navy. Next. <laughs> that was my introduction to the Navy. Were you um, inducted? Were you, was there a draft at that time for you? Or did you go in as a volunteer? I was drafted. And the first meal that I was given was my first non-kosher meal, a ham sandwich and an apple in the induction center in New York City. And you remember that vividly, I'm sure. You remember that vividly? Yes, yes, I, I do. <laughs> uh, 
uh, that the, the Navy was what your choice was, whether that was your own choice or the Navy's choice. Um, when you joined the military, did you have other family members or friends joining also? Oh, yes. Uh, well, not the Navy, but uh, uh, there were five or six of us who grew up together in Brooklyn. Uh, there was uh, Walter, who was in the Army, and I hope we get to the point where I can tell you about our meeting in uh, uh, Hawaii and his brother, Seymour, who I met in Okinawa, and uh, Arnold, uh, another Arnold, who was uh, uh, a lieutenant in the Air Force, and Bernie, who was a, uh, a lieutenant uh, in the Dental Corps. And did all of those men make it out of their service? Yes, we did, thank God. And do you still stay in touch with any of them? Yes, all of them. That's well, wonderful. one of them's passed away. Mm -hmm. So you were childhood friends, and through your adult life, you stayed on as friends. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Where did you have your basic training? And tell us a little bit about that. Uh, I was uh, sent to, uh, this is uh, Samson, New York, which was the, uh, the training site, and uh, an interesting occurrence there. Uh, they, uh, they took me to a pool with, with the rest of the company and they said, went up to the diving board and they said, now jump. I said, I can't swim. You know, I'm afraid. I never jump into the water. He says, you jump or we're going to push you. And so I saw no alternative, but I jumped. Luckily, I hit bottom. And I pushed myself up and I waddled to the side. As a consequence, every afternoon, this is July and August, I think I was in, in boot camp. It's called boot camp, the uh, Navy. I was thinking I was there for approximately six weeks. Well, every afternoon in the hot July and August, I had to go to the cool confines of a pool, which was covered. But air circulated. It wasn't indoor, but it was an outdoor pool covered. And so I tried to swim. Because I was swimming, I couldn't drill, march, take hikes, or go with a pack on hikes. And I missed uh, rifle range. I missed gun training. But uh, I... Uh, uh, as later on, we'll see, I, uh, uh, it was a disadvantage to me to miss that. Mm -hmm. But it was at their suggestion or their demand that you learn to swim? Yes. Mm -hmm. And this was in 1943? I was inducted in about June, July. Oh, yes, that was still 43. 1943. Um, during that time, what did you like and dislike about your everyday life? At boot camp? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that occurred to me or happened to me was I was assigned to make uh, uh, the boilers, stow the boilers in the morning for the company so they could have hot water. I guess I was a little overzealous. And needless to say, in the morning, all hell broke loose because the company didn't get water. They got steam. And the building, they said, was bouncing because of the pressure. Needless to say, they never gave me that task again. And uh, I had KP there, pearl diving. I had to wash pots and pans. And as with my entire Navy life, I never ate butter, never liked butter. And so when this became known to the rest of the company, they would follow me on the chow line because they wanted my butter. And so I always had people following me around. It's a true story, even. Because butter was in demand at that well, time. Well, no, they, everybody got one slice one of butter, slice and that was slab. it. Sure. Yeah. The, the, um, 
the uh, the word was you can take all you want, but you've got to eat everything. But they only got one slice of butter. After you finished your six weeks of boot camp, what happened after that? Where did you go? Uh, after boot camp, I uh, was assigned to go to amphibious training in Maryland. When I finished my training there, I got leave. And I came home, and everybody asked me, you know, where I'd been. Well, I told them I'd been to the Solomons. At that time, the Solomons was a place where it was uh, not healthy to be. Uh, there was this, uh, uh, a lot of ships being sunk and a lot of fighting going on. And so everybody looked at me and all. And uh, I never told them that I was in Solomon's, Maryland. <laughs> and uh, that, was, uh, that was my experience at the Solomon's, Maryland. So there was a sense of humor for an 18-year-old back then. Well, that was one of them. And, uh, Did that uh, help you through your following years? I hope so. I was too young to appreciate what was happening. Uh, it was all so new to me and so young that nothing means anything. You followed uh, what you were told to do. Were you, and I use this word, were you out at some point in time on a ship? Uh, was I shipped out? Oh yes, mm -hmm. oh yes. When did that happen? Uh, I was, uh, well, actually continuing the story, after the Solomons, they sent me to uh, Louisiana, New Orleans, Louisiana, waiting for my ship. And uh, I think at that time I was assigned to a, uh, to a flotilla. And uh, while waiting for my ship, uh, there was a, uh, on the bulletin board, they were looking for people to uh, bring back <coughs> sailors who were AWOL. Since I had nothing to do with the time and no duties, I volunteered. The first duty was to Alaska. I figured, <laughs> They'll never be able to ship me out going to Alaska. Unfortunately, I didn't get that duty. But I did get assigned to a company, uh, another SP, to a southern city. And I forgot. I'm going to say Knoxville, but I'm not sure. And we got to Knoxville, the two of us. And we walked into the jail. And to my surprise, in Japan, there's this young sailor. This young girl in his arms, hugging and kissing. She's crying. She, um, her, the, her, his mother was there holding a young baby in her arms. She's in tears. And I felt so bad. I, I, I didn't know what to do, but unfortunately we had to finally break them up and uh, take them away. If, it was, if I had my choice, I would have left them there. Sure. But I, the senior SP, uh, unfortunately, uh, insisted that uh, we take him back. Now, when you say SP, do you mean special police? Shore patrol. Shore patrol. Yes, Thank it's you. A, it's special police, really, but shore patrol is the name I think they use. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also went on another shore patrol duty. Uh, I don't remember much about this, but I do remember a uh, a Pullman train, and the train was full of sailors going to the brig. And uh, we were assigned to police the uh, Pullman at each end. And uh, when we were off duty, we had the bunks on the end of the car. When I finished my, my duty, I climbed into my bunk. And I pulled out my pistol, and I was looking at it. 
And as I was doing it, the chief walked by and he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm inspecting this, my, my gun. He says, well, don't touch the safety catch. And I said, what's the safety catch? And he looked at me <laughs> and he just laughed. And I, he didn't realize I had never taken training. I never learned to shoot a gun. And so uh, that was one of the, uh, one of the uh, uh, occurrences that I thought were a little humorous, but uh, it's true. And, uh, and so uh, we picked up a ship in New Orleans. I was assigned to a ship finally. And uh, I, I got leave from, me, from New Orleans too. And actually I come home this time and everybody's asking, where have you been? What action have you seen? Oh, I've been to Algiers. At the time Algiers, I think the Americans had landed in uh, South Africa. And uh, I think the battleship Massachusetts was in a battle there and was hit with a shell. Well, when I said Algiers, they looked at me in awe. My, what a hero. Again, I didn't tell them that I was in Algiers, Louisiana, which is right outside, adjacent to, to New Orleans. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I finally was assigned as a passenger on a ship in New Orleans to take me out to the Pacific. We were on the L, LST 890. I was just a passenger. And uh, we, we went on the ship in New Orleans. We went through the Panama Canal, which was something I still remember. And my doing any lull in conversation, I always Asked somebody, why do they have locks in the Panama Canal? And uh, the reason is not that the oceans are different or anything. The reason is money. If they were to dig a 50 mile ditch across the, the isthmus, of, they'd still be digging. But what our ingenious engineers did on that job was they created a lake at a higher elevation. The contour of the isthmus was favorable. And so they created a lake at a, at a higher level on the isthmus so that when the ship came in from the Atlantic Ocean, we, the, the, uh, the uh, locks lifted us up to the lake. And we traveled for 10, 15 miles in the lake. That's 10, 15 miles. They didn't have this to dig. And this dig, this hole was enormous. If you saw pictures of it uh, that I've seen on TV as they were digging it, you know, it, it's unimaginable how much uh, uh, they had to dig. And so it saved them time and money. And so that's what they did. The locks are there so they can get a ship up to their land, to their uh, lake, which they made, man-made lake. And of course, they let them down. I think there were three locks, though, but I'm not sure. I forgot. Mira, I forgot the names. Mira Flores. I forgot the names. But the and then once you got off and out of the area of Panama Canal, did you join up with a group? Were you put on another ship? No, that, that ship, I don't think I picked up the staff. I was assigned to a staff, mm -hmm. an LCT staff. And I don't remember whether, I don't think we picked up the ship yet. But from, from uh, the Panama Canal, we stopped off at San Diego. And then we went to uh, Hawaii. And uh, I think there we probably picked up the rest of the, some of the crew of the staff. What, what I was assigned to was we had a commander, Schuler, who uh, was in charge of a fleet of LCTs. These LCTs go up on the beach, and they could carry tanks and a number of tanks. In other words, four or five tanks. They could carry trucks. They could carry personnel. They were relatively, 
I don't know, 100 feet, some, some size there. And so in order to tell them where to go, what ships to go, where to bring ammunition, where to pick up wounded, where to bring food, uh, where to uh, uh, take prisoners. So our ships would, our commander would communicate to these ships and say, go this battleship and take shells or bring this back or take the wounded to this beach and do this and that. That basically was what our, our ship was. And uh, we had a doctor, we had a paymaster, we had the yeomen, they were clerks, they took care of all the records for all the ships in the flotilla. And uh, uh, we had a chief gunner's mate, and we had a, uh, a gunner's mate and a pharmacist mate who was a, uh, it's interesting to know that the pharmacist mate was really in action. Ship was sunk under him. I think it was the cruiser Indianapolis or Chicago, I don't remember the names, but he was in the water. We also had a gunner's mate who had seen service in the Mediterranean, and he was one of the people who fired at American planes. They didn't know who they were. And it wasn't newspapers, I remember reading about it. But he admitted, he said, we didn't know who he was shooting at. So did he, they, they did. share these stories with all of you while you were? They on? wouldn't talk about much of it. Mm -hmm. And we didn't want to ask them, you know. But they were assigned to us because they thought it would be a place for them on a staff ship, mm -hmm. which really wasn't a fighting ship. Our ship was basically to go on land with troops, but they took out the gangplanks and the stairways, and they made it just for a command ship, you know, to give uh, a medical office, uh, uh, an office for the uh, clerks, and so forth. Were you able to maintain friendships with some of the people on this LCT? No, unfortunately, unfortunately not. A lot of the personnel were from Detroit. The Commander Schuler was from Detroit. His father was a, an executive at General Motors, and he told us all, after the war, if you need a job, come up to Detroit. And uh, that was what he did. Did you ever see him after the war? Uh, no, Commander Schuler, no. Or, no, but it's an interesting to note that while I was in Hawaii, we stopped, I don't know why they stopped off there, I can't figure out the Navy, but we were there for a while. I think that was the tent. I have some pictures of a tent where we were located in Hawaii. In Hawaii, I, for some reason or other, I met one of my boyhood friends who grew up, Walter. He was in the Army, and I found out where he was, and I went to visit him. And it's amusing to know that while I was talking to him and his buddies, I see a big line of sailors with ponchos and everything on the line. And I finally said, Walter, what is that for? He said, don't you know? I said, no. He said, that's short arm inspection. In case you don't know what short arm inspection is, they inspect sailors for venerable diseases. And to me, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> and this was what the line was for. And then they wanted to take me to chow, so they gave me a mess kit. And I fidgeted and fidgeted and fidgeted. I couldn't assemble it. <laughs> and these, these soldiers were laughing at me somebody who couldn't assemble a mess kit. And so they finally showed me how to assemble the mess kit so I could get some chow. I don't remember what I ate, but I was so fortunate in that I don't remember ever eating anything on a shingle. I don't remember eating any spam. I remember having eggs made to order. I would go to the chef and say, I want eggs light side up. That was, that was the type of food we had. And so uh, that was my experience in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And uh, we finally picked up the ship. I don't know whether it was near Saipan or not. The staff ship, the LCI 791. That was the ship I was assigned to. And Commander Schuler, God bless him, he, uh, he left the States and he said, what shall I I have an empty ship. 
you know, what am I going to do with the, all the room I have? He decided to put beer and coke in the, in the empty rooms. So when we got overseas, we had two cans of beer or two cokes every night. And needless to say, when we passed another ship and they saw us drinking beer, they would <laughs> be very, very angry and uh, they would plead, throw us some beer, you know. But uh, that's, that's the experience there. Now, when you picked up the LCI 791, was this a larger ship than the LCTs? Oh, yes. Well, it was a different type of ship. An LCT had a, a gangplank. Mm -hmm. uh, if you've seen the ships, if, have you seen um, uh, Private Ryan? Saving Private Ryan, the new movie. The, 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 ships that, yes. the ships that came ashore was very small. They carried about 20, 30. Uh, uh, no, our, the LCT was much bigger. It was uh, 100. How, about how many, how many members of the staff were on that ship? On the LCI 791? Yes. The LCI 791 had, had a ship's crew. They ran the ship. In other words, they uh, uh, stood the watches. They uh, took care of the boilers. Uh, they uh, maintained the ship. And they supplied the cook and so forth. We were a staff. We were like passengers. And as I've indicated before, we had the staff. And what we did was to communicate to our LCTs, which were uh, which were uh, 100, 100 feet maybe long with a gangplank. So once you got overseas, did you go from port to port as needed? Explain a little bit of that and where, you, where your key locations no, we, were. Uh, when we picked up, when I boarded the LCI 791, we uh, went to Okinawa. And we got to Okinawa, I think, on the 2nd of April. It was invaded April 1st. And not all of the island was secure. And so we anchored, uh, I think it's Buckner Bay now called. And uh, uh, the order of the day was make smoke. In other words, all the ships there. We had evidently experienced kamikaze attacks in that area. And uh, so uh, all the ships to protect themselves, they made smoke. We had big uh, smoke uh, makers at the stern of the ship. And uh, all the ships made smoke at night and during the daytime to try to hide ourselves. Could from. you see some of the perils of that invasion from where you were located on your ship? Uh, we didn't see at night. At night, we could see uh, they would f the uh, the uh, they would f shoot flares up so that they could uh, make light. They could see something, you know, where the Japanese were, what the uh, uh, what the terrain looked like, and so we'd see the flares going up, and you heard the guns and the cannons firing, you know, all night long. Uh, At uh, this point, you're about 19 years old. This was in 1944. What was it like for a young man hearing these guns and cannons and, and it, I never, it, I, my life was never threatened from attack, uh, from firing. Uh, the kamikazes would go to the bigger ships or they would go to the ships uh, out on the, uh, on, the, uh, on the line, protection line. We had a uh, a line of ships to let us know that the planes were coming. And uh, uh, I, I just was ambivalent. I was too young to realize what was happening, what the perils were. Uh, uh, we, never, we had machine guns aboard ship, but uh, we had never fired them. Uh, no, no reason to fire them. Uh, one of the uh, the most the most uh, 
devastating, a traumatic experience for me in my entire Navy career was experiencing typhoons. Our ship was 150 feet maybe long, and we had anchors at each end. And when a typhoon came, we would throw anchors in the front, anchors in the back, and try to stabilize ourselves. One time, I know we went up north, and we, we, we uh, secluded ourselves in the river, which was ideal. But lots of times, we were caught out. We were anchored basically about 1,000 feet offshore where we, where we were. Uh, uh, the beach was in proximity. And, uh, Would that have been in the Okinawa area? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. I we were 1,000 feet off Okinawa. Mm -hmm. And uh, we hit a number of typhoons. One in particular, I haven't told you before, but I get seasick very easily. When we were in the Solomons, they took me out on Chesapeake Bay, and I get sick. When we left, when we left uh, uh, New Orleans, I got in my bunk on the ship. We were passengers, no duties. I got on in my bunk, and I laid in my bunk. And all I ate was potatoes and bread until we got to a port, and then I would get up. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> you didn't do a lot while you were on the ship going from port no, to port. No, we were passengers. Mm -hmm. We were not ship's company, we were passengers. And uh, uh, this particular typhoon, typhoon gut, the ship is rocking. Where am I? I'm down in my bunk. And I'm sitting, laying there, you know, nothing, thinking of nothing. And when I hear all hands topside in their life jackets. Needless to say, I got cured of seasickness in one second. I was in my life jacket, and I was topside in one second. I could have beaten Jesse Owens to get up topside. And most of the crew was up there, and there was a big life raft, and I naturally gravitated adjacent to the life raft. I had my hand on it. And we, we waited there, I don't know, I don't know how long, can't tell. It seemed like years, ages. But finally, they told us that the, uh, uh, that the storm was abating or something. And uh, uh, I don't know what happened, but all I know is the next thing I know, the life raft, somebody, somebody let the life raft off the ship. I don't want to say who it was. I don't know who it was, but I denied it. <laughs> and, uh, and then finally, the, uh, the pressure, uh, 29 inches of mercury, we started to abate. And so then we relaxed a little bit. But that was the worst experience I've had. We've been to other typhoons where the ship shake, rattled, and rolled, but uh, never like that where we were told to go topside. I, some of our LCTs uh, had deaths. We lost uh, some sailors and some typhoons there. And I have some pictures of some of the ships are uh, beached because of these typhoons. And uh, uh, that was my, my worst experience, mm -hmm. worst scare. So rather than seeing direct combat, you were assisting those ships that were seeing direct combat. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, basically that was what we did. Do you get the impression that as an 18-year-old going into the Navy, did not know how to swim, certainly had a sense of humor and compassion from what I'm hearing, that you were totally unprepared for your service in the Navy? Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Did others on your ship feel the same way? I assume everybody did. I don't see how anybody can uh, can prepare for for something uh, like uh, going into the service. Now you had mentioned earlier to me off camera that you and then on camera again about meeting your friend Walter in Hawaii. 
Tell us about how you hooked up with Walter's brother. Yes. Oh, yes. This is, uh, we were, uh, the fighting took place, a lot of fighting took place on Okinawa. It's a pretty big island. And uh, just to give you a reference about the fighting there, I believe that 10,000 soldiers were killed in Okinawa. And uh, I calculated, if my calculations are right, that's 200 soldiers per state. That's 200 young men died in Massachusetts just in Okinawa. Just in Okinawa. Mind-boggling. It's mind-boggling. I, uh, I never realized it then, after I saw Private Ryan. It comes back to me now. So uh, it's just an amazing situation. I was very, very fortunate. Somebody was looking over me. Mm -hmm. And Walter's and, brother, what was his duty? Walter, uh, Walter's brother, Seymour, uh, he was a, uh, uh, an airplane mechanic. He would uh, 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 repair planes. I have pictures of some of the planes here. And uh, Walter, uh, uh, brother Seymour, was uh, was uh, uh, he he volunteered for the navy, and he stayed in the afterwards. In fact, he married a Japanese, uh, an Japanese girl uh, later on. And did he settle back in the states? Yes, he did. Mm -hmm. So he was stationed in Okinawa at a time when you were over there? Yes, And yes. what was it like getting together with an old family friend from Brooklyn, New York? Uh, I think he was ecstatic, <laughs> ecstatic. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, he, uh, he was so, ex well, yes, I won't say anything. Uh, Did you hear from members of the ship, did you, were you able to get mail? Were you able to get uh, newspapers or reports about the war and what was happening elsewhere? Yes, we had, uh, we had radio. And in fact, mail brings up uh, another, another anecdote. When the island was uh, practically secured, 90% cured, I think the Japanese we're just at one end of the island, and uh, the end was near. And uh, we were toward the middle of the island, as my map, I think, will show. And so the island was pretty secure. And uh, uh, I, uh, my duties as electronic technician's mate, I didn't tell you about my schooling. Uh, can I can go, sure? go back? You sure? Go right bit? back to that part. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, after, after, after boot camp, Samson, New York, I went to Wright Junior College uh, for four weeks to learn pre-radio. And uh, Wright Junior College was located on a block in Chicago. And the rule was sailors cannot cross the street. But civilians, and especially girls, could. Needless to say, we had more girls on that block than in the entire state of Chicago. <laughs> After Chicago, I was assigned to Logan, Utah, Utah State Agricultural College. We went there for three months in the cold, and I was assigned, we were, uh, we were uh, bunked in the uh, animal husbandry building. They had great ice cream down below, and uh, an interesting fact is I took pictures. I had pictures taken of myself when I was there. And some and that 30, would have been in 1943, well, uh, uh, probably. When I, I was there for three months. I was at, for a month. I was at boot camp for six weeks. That's one, two, three, four. Uh, well, whatever it is, it's pretty close. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, anyway, something like 35 years later, my wife and I went back, and we took pictures, hopefully in the same locations that I had taken 35 years previously. And it is Utah State University? 
I beg your pardon? Utah, Utah State, State Agricultural, Agricultural College. College. Mm -hmm. Up in Logan, Utah, that's mm -hmm. the mountains mm -hmm. uh, up there. It's a beautiful country. And uh, So you learned radio, pre-radio. Uh, 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 yes, I, uh, after Logan, Utah, I was sent to uh, uh, Radio Material School in Treasure Island in the middle of San Francisco Bay. And we spent something like six, seven months there. And actually we learned not only radio to repair radios, and, but radar. And uh, our duties were to repair radios and radar, communications, uh, electronics for the Navy. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that was my, my function. So aboard ship, my duty was to keep the radar going and to make sure that we could uh, transmit messages to and from the ships to our LCTs to tell them where to go. And if they had a problem with their radios, they would come to us and uh, uh, tie up alongside and I would go aboard and fix it. Or we would have an LCVP take me out to where they were and I would either bring a new radio or try to fix what they had. I'm sorry, I missed that gap. That's in all right. You caught it all. In learning this technique, is that what possibly might have planned for your future? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, it, it would appear to me then this was a period of time between 1943 and 1945 that you were um, an electronic technician's mate. And at what period of time were you coming back to the States? Did something? Uh, the atomic bomb, we were in Okinawa, and uh, we were, we were uh, waiting uh, to uh, invade uh, Japan. And uh, fortunately, uh, my birthday is August 3rd. In the early er, August, you think it's the first or the second, we dropped, we dropped, I think, the atomic bomb. Had you heard any types of rumors about something like this happening prior no. to it happening? No. Mm -hmm. Once you heard about it, what was the sense that you got from not just yourself, but from your shipmates? I don't know whether we got the details. All we know is that the war had ended. And all I know is we fired our guns that day. We had some machine guns. We fired it. I mean, I, we might have killed people. Who knows? But we, everybody was firing their guns. You know, everything. All hell broke loose. Everybody was so happy. And uh, uh, we, uh, uh, while waiting in Okinawa to go home, we had to have points at that time. And the ship we were on was too small or they didn't want to transport us back to the States on it. We needed a bigger ship. And so uh, we were waiting for a bigger ship. While we were waiting, and I knew I had a couple of months to spend on Okinawa because I didn't have enough points. Uh, in order to get back, you had to have points to get back. Accumulate points, your age and the time, time you spent you overseas spent. and so forth. I knew I wasn't going soon. And then again, they were looking for volunteers to go to China. And so I <laughs> volunteered. I thought it was like shore patrol, but uh, uh, the ship went to China and we anchored in the Yangtze River, which was a dirty river, just like the uh, Mississippi, full of sand, uh, very dirty. And uh, we, uh, we, uh, we first uh, boarded a little uh, I, I don't know what to call the boats, but they row it from the back. One person row from the back. I never saw one before. But that's where everybody did it there, to cross the Yangtze. And uh, we, uh, we, uh, uh, we walked around the city a little bit, Shanghai, and not too far. <laughs> and most of us uh, together <laughs> never walked alone. And uh, a lot of, uh, and uh, one time I know we see a, a blonde woman walking, and we all, we hadn't seen 
well, ner we haven't seen nurses either, by the way. And we saw this blonde woman walking. And next to her is Chinese. We were told they were white Russians. But a lot of, a lot of that, there, a lot of people to escape the war had come to, uh, to Shanghai uh, to live there or to marry there, whatever it was. And being in a, a foreign Asian country, um, a young man from Brooklyn, this was one of your first experiences, possibly Abs seeing another culture? Absolutely. Were you Absolutely. able to communicate in any way with any of the... Um afraid to. Mm -hmm. We were afraid. <laughs> we, you know, uh, uh, we know there was, uh, the war was over, but, uh, you know, these foreign faces, all you, uh, uh, all the people looked like uh, they were enemies, you know, we slant the eyes and so forth. And so we were reluctant to go about. We, I know we stopped off the USO, and we didn't even, we didn't even eat anything. The Chinese food, we are afraid to. But uh, we ate at the USO. And uh, uh, to see these people uh, uh, pull alongside our ship, which was anchored, and try to sell us. I, uh, uh, I, I, I bought uh, uh, a sword. I bought uh, a little bell made in China. I bought uh, a radio, a little radio, which was a waste of money. I didn't use money in order to buy this. Cigarettes. We had cigarettes aboard ship. Well, we take a carton of cigarettes, get anything you want, anything you want. And, uh, uh, but the poverty is unmistakable. You can see it, you know, people, utter poverty. And uh, I spent it there, and uh, I finally uh, boarded a, uh, got back to uh, Okinawa, and I finally boarded a troop ship to go back. Now, h how long a period of time were you in China? A very short time, maybe a week or so, very short time. So then after arriving back at Okinawa, that's when you boarded a troop ship to come home? Time, Something time, like that. Time meant nothing out there. One of the things that uh, people find it hard to believe, when I was aboard ship out there, I didn't know what month it was. I definitely didn't know what day it was. Sometimes I would wonder what year it was. Because time meant nothing. Mm -hmm. I had no commitments, no engagements to make. And so time was immaterial. And uh, I don't remember exactly how long, but it must have been sometime. I think it was about four or five months. I waited to get back home after the war. When you came back home, did you come into New York or did you come into the West Coast? I came into Treasure Island, where I had been to school for six, seven months. Treasure Island is, if you... The, the, uh, in San Francisco, they have the Oakland Bay Bridge. Well, in the middle of the Oakland Bay Bridge is an island. It's called Yerba Buena. Well, Treasure Island, the naval base, was on Yerba Buena. And so you could, in the middle of the bridge, you could drive down to Yerba Buena. And well, anyway, I landed at Treasure Island. The first thing I did was run and get an ice cream soda. That's first, what you missed the most. First thing I missed. And then, well, how long a period, go ahead. I forgot something to tell you, in Okinawa. I had nothing to do, talking about mail. You asked me about mail on, mm -hmm. digress. Mail, I had nothing to do. Volunteer, who wants to go aboard and pick up the mail? I volunteered. So the LCVP would drive me to the beach. They had a Jeep there for me, assigned to me. And the only problem was that Jeeps were at a premium there. They were, the, they were stolen by the dozens. If you had a Jeep, you had to watch it day and night. So what we would do was we'd take the road around. You wouldn't leave it, you'd take the road around. That's how bad it was. And anyway, I got the Jeep. I would drive to the uh, 
there was a marine, uh, a marine uh, recreation area where they played ping pong. I played ping pong. I became a champion there. I played three games, and you can only play three games if you won. And I would always win my three games, and I always had a league. Nobody could beat me. And I'd pick up the mail, and then I would pick up uh, movies, movies to play aboard ship at night. And uh, in driving around the island, we'd be throwing beer cans and, and soda bottles, and everybody <laughs> would be after us. You know, what are you, where are you getting to give us some, you know? And uh, so uh, we had quite an experience, and gas. In the island, you had a pump. Nobody was there. Nobody watched. You drove the jeep up and you took gas. Mm -hmm. That was it. Mm -hmm. That was how fantastic it was there. It was uh, it was unusual to say the least. Certainly. But so I learned to drive. I learned how to take the rotor out to protect the jeep so it's not stolen. So you didn't know how to drive no. prior to? No. I think my brother had given me a lesson or two, but I didn't know how to drive. We didn't. Uh, I must have been able to drive before a little bit, but uh, I learned how to drive there. Drove uh, down the island. So then once you made it back to San Francisco, how much time did you have left in your service? Or No, uh, when I got to San Francisco, uh, uh, we boarded a train s soon after, and I was discharged uh, in Lido Beach, New York. 1946, March, I think, March of 46. What were your feelings coming home? Ecstatic. <laughs> How about your family and friends? Well, I'm sure they were all very happy to see me. I hope. <laughs> I know I was happy to see them. How important, looking back now, do you feel your military service was to you, not only looking back, but also for your present life? It was of enormous help and advantage. It was unbelievable. Uh, here I was, I was given, I won't say a million dollar, but I was given a tremendous education in the Navy. Tremendous. I went to school for approximately a year. I was in the Navy for three years, and I went to school approximately a year, uh, pretty much. And I learned a tremendous amount uh, of uh, knowledge about electronics. And so consequently, uh, my brother was an engineer, my brother-in-law was an engineer, and consequently, I went to engineering school, and I got my degree in electrical engineering. And then from there, you went to Raytheon? No, I worked, uh, I worked for a company in um, New York called Coil Winders for a while. But uh, I got sick for a year, and so I, uh, in 1958, I spent a year, spent a year uh, due to an infectious disease, uh, tuberculosis. Was it war-related? No, mm -hmm. I don't believe so. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never tried, but uh, that was many years afterward. Mm -hmm. and, uh, was that a difficult time for you because were you away from family or mm -hmm. were you married at that time? So you had to leave your wife. And children. And children. How was that for your wife? Terrible. Much worse than it was for me. Mm -hmm. Was she able to get help from family and friends or uh, medical coverage for? We, I, at the time I got sick, we lived in Long Island. And uh, we lived in Beth Page. And uh, I went, the Nassau County, Nassau County Sanitarium mm -hmm. was close by. And so one day we decided to go get a chest x-ray. And uh, that was the that was the end. You didn't have any thought, any pre previous. I probably did, but I didn't, didn't recognize know. it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A very sad time in our life. Mm 
Mm. Very, very. But you picked up the pieces and came back to? In, uh, in, in, uh, in 1959, I took a job with Raytheon, 59, and I stayed with Raytheon in Bedford till 1963. Mm. And in 1963, I went to work for the MIT Instrumentation Lab. I worked there for 10 years. And, uh, well, I, this is not interested in the Navy, this is, uh, I then worked for another company mm -hmm. because uh, we, MIT, we divested from MIT. Mm -hmm. And I retired. Uh, I worked there until I retired. The Child Stock Draper Laboratory. From the Draper Labs. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you were settled in Natick at that time. Yes, I lived in Natick. Looking back, also, um, what did you think then, as a very young man, and what do you think now about the war effort? I never questioned it. At that time, at that time, the mentality was the government they asked you to do something, you do it. And that was the way I was brought up. Mm -hmm. And that was my mentality. Consequently, there were never any second thoughts. Mm -hmm. You went, you did what you had to do, your obligation. Everybody else did it. You mentioned earlier in the interview about having seen the most recent movie the Steven Spielberg movie, uh, Saving Private Ryan. And having seen that, did that bring up a lot of issues or did it, did it clarify for you different parts of the war that you didn't know about? Or, or how, did you, how did you come out of that movie feeling? I thank God that they put me in the Navy. I'm glad they didn't put me in the Signal Corps. Mm -hmm. One of the things also with my wife there is uh, one of the pictures on the beach, there's a big ship, landing ship, on the beach, in the background. Must be two, 200 feet long or something. That was a type of ship, flat bottom ship, that I went from the Panama Canal uh, all the way out past uh, uh, Hawaii. And so I showed my wife the ship that I went through the Panama Canal. In. One of the questions that we've asked another, a number of the other veterans that we've interviewed uh, that I'd like to, a couple of questions I'd like to ask you also. One of them being your feeling about the difference of opinion from the public regarding the veterans of World War II, of the Korean conflict, and of the Vietnam War, how they were treated. We, uh, we were treated, I think, fantastically. We had the GI Bill of Rights. I went to, uh, I went to the City College of New York, which actually was a free institution. Uh, the only uh, uh, grades were the only uh, 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 matter that counted in order to uh, enter. But namely the GI Bill, I got my books paid for, and uh, it helped the college. And so uh, uh, it helped me enormously. I, to be able to get my degree in electrical engineering was a, something which I'll never forget. And I appreciate uh, what the government did for me. These um, benefits were also allowed to the Vietnam veterans. But where do you see, do you see a difference between the way they were treated and the way you were treated? Well, absolutely, uh, absolutely. Everybody in World War II was treated as a hero. Everybody was treated with respect and awe. Vietnam, it, Vietnam was a, uh, was a mixture. It was bad and good. It was, it was not, uh, it was not anything like World War II. The, uh, the mentality, the outlook, uh, was was altogether different, and uh, 
I think the uh, Korean War might have been a little better there. There we tried to do what was right, and uh, people appreciate it, but I don't think the servicemen were treated with the respect and awe that we had in World War II, because I think we won. Mm -hmm. That there was a clear winner and loser. A clear winner. We set out to do something, and we did it. Mm -hmm. Those were losing wars, and the American people, American public, don't like losers. As a final question, do you have any comments or thoughts that you'd like to leave with us that, that can be left for your family or for the community or researchers who might be viewing this tape in the future? Well, war, war is usually hell, but for some of us it's an education. And the only heroes in war are the ones who have their names outside who gave their life for their country. The rest of us, we did our duty, but we did what we had to do, but we're not heroes. Well, we'd like to thank you for your story because you have certainly put another slant to a time in our lives, in our families' lives, that we feel is very important for people to hear about. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me.